Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. What's up? I'm well, Alfred. How are you? And I see we've got people from all over the world here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, we're going to be presenting uh, our today's topic would be how can I develop as a teacher using tools, media, notes, and homework in classroom. It's going to be conducted by me, Alfred, and Craig. Now let's move on to a small introduction about ourselves. So uh, my name is Alfred. I've been a community tutor uh, since August the 5th. Uh, I've been teaching Egyptian Arabic. I'm currently studying pharmaceutical science and I'm so passionate about languages. Um, and I've started uh, teaching out of passion because I've been teaching kids from rural areas how to read and write for almost two years now. So now let's hear some, some a little bit of uh, Craig. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. So my name is Craig. I'm from South Africa, and I've been teaching on Italki since um, April 2020. Um, I am an English teacher and TESOL trainer with 13 years experience. So I'm really happy to be conducting this and uh, hopefully giving you guys some good advice on lesson plannings and so on. Uh, my hobbies are playing the guitar, listening to music, amongst other things. I do love languages and food, etc. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today. Okay, awesome. Let's start. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be having um, four sections for today's um, webinar. We're going to be talking about lesson planning, study planning, giving feedback, and giving and checking homework. Uh, first and third topic would be conducted by Craig, and second and fourth topic will be con conducted by me. So let's start, Craig. All right, let's start off with lesson planning. And lesson planning is probably one of the most daunting things that new teachers experience. Um, it can be tricky, but with a few tips and tricks, um, I'm sure you'll become proficient at this. And uh, as the wise Benjamin Franklin says there, if you plan, if you fail to plan, sorry, you're planning to fail. So as a teacher, <clears throat> absolutely essential that you do plan. And let's go over to the next slide and I'll speak about why we need to plan. So a lot of people have course books, right? And I'm sure you've seen these. Um, they are broad variety and they are very useful, especially for new teachers, um, because you aren't really required to plan because the course books take you through every single step, but they're not perfect. They might be culturally biased, a bit formulaic, a bit monotonous, and planning helps teachers adapt course books to suit lesson requirements. Remember on italki, you're teaching one-on-one -on -one lessons. So while a course book is great, perhaps for a group um, interaction, it might not suit your student specific needs, but planning can allow you to take materials from a course book and adapt it into an entirely new lesson, which is this great skill to have. Um, number two, planning builds pre-lesson confidence. You know, some students or some teachers actually tell me, Ah, I'll just wing it. And then when I see them teach, I can see that they are a little bit flustered because they don't know what's going on. So if you have a plan, you're definitely more confident in your classroom. And of course, students can pick up on whether a teacher is prepared or not. Um, trust me, you might ooze confidence and you know, in your personality, but when it comes to your material, students will be able to see whether this person actually has planned or not. So on italki, prepared teachers are far more likely to retain students. One of the common um, or areas that students complain about is for not taking another lesson with a teacher is that the teacher did not plan materials suited for them. Okay, so this is extremely important. And the last point there, regular planning allows teachers to become proficient in exploiting media and text for teaching purposes. So if you're watching a YouTube video, for example, or reading a magazine article, and you think, wow, this is really interesting. I think I would love to use this in my class. If you plan um, regularly and get used to planning, you can easily adapt those materials and implement them into your classroom. So becoming an autonomous teacher is the aim here. All right, let's move on. So what should an ideal lesson plan contain? Um, just by the way, there are a few lesson plan templates out there. <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen many of them have this uh, table format. Um, I will be adding or we will be creating a forum on italki later with some links to some templates for you. Okay, but once you have a lesson concept in mind, it's time to put it all together. 
number one, very importantly, your aims and outcomes. So think about what you want the student to be able to do by the end of the lesson. If it's a grammar lesson, they'll be able to recognize a tense, use it, and confidently create sentences from um, you, with this uh, structure. If it's vocabulary, they'll learn new words and definitions and be able to um, use them in sentences. With pronunciation, they'll be able to improve their speaking, etc. So what's the point of the lesson? Number two, problems, possible problems and solutions. So it takes a little bit of experience to predict what problems might happen in a classroom. But after a while, you do get the knack of it. For example, some possible problems might be students could struggle with the pronunciation of new words. How do I solve that? My solution would be to practice pronunciation through drilling and repetition. Um, students might struggle with a certain grammar point structure. How do I solve that? I will explain the structure, have some worksheets to practice, and so on. Number three, all your materials, audio visual aids, handouts, links, cloud-based aids, Google Shared Docs, and screen sharing. So having a list of all the materials that you have in your lesson or have planned for your lesson will really help while you're teaching. So you can um, just cross-reference onto your, on your lesson plan and make sure you have those ready. Um, because we're teaching online, on italki, you can't obviously have actual handouts, but things like Google Shared Docs is amazing. I use it in my lessons quite frequently, and you can see what the student is doing in real time, you know, typing out um, sentences, and you can highlight things, underline words, uh, and so on. Screen sharing is also great. If you have a worksheet, for example, and you don't have Google Shared Docs, you know, screen share uh, your, your screen, and students can see what's happening there. Timing is very important. It might be difficult initially for um, beginner teachers to figure out exactly how much time they'll spend on activities, um, but it does get a little bit easier. If you have an idea of how much time you're going to take, that's the most important thing. And you can recognize if you're going over or under time. Number five, your procedures. How are you going to move through the lessons? Giving instructions, um, asking students to complete tasks, giving feedback, all of these little things. And I'll cover some of them a little bit later. Then interaction between teacher and students. Who's going to do, be doing most of the talking here? Generally, we try to keep lessons student focused. So you want students to communicate as much as possible, but there are times that the teacher needs to speak. And then lastly, language notes. So <clears throat> especially if you're new to teaching grammar, um, having some notes on the structure and the rules could really help you if a student asks you a question and you're not sure you can refer to your notes without having to just think from the top of your head. Okay, so let's go to the next page here, and this will show you what you can do on italki Classroom. So once you've got this lesson plan in mind and you've got all the things that you need in your lesson plan, go to italki Classroom, click on Edit Lesson Plan, and you can input these things, your learning objectives, your aims, the materials, the language analysis, the structure of everything, and you know, you do some feedback. So everything I've explained, you can do this on italki Classroom, which is really, really great. And you send this off to, this, to the student as well, so they can see that you have planned the lesson, and you can make notes. And as you move along with your lessons, um, lesson one, two, three, four, and five, this will start building up, and you can then have a record for the student. Okay, next slide, I'll just give you a brief overview of um, a basic framework um, for all skills. <clears throat> just to give you a nice little summary of how to approach a lesson. So initially we have a pre-task stage and that's what's called the lead-in. And here you can activate your students' interests with prior knowledge, pictures or songs, questions. So if you're doing a lesson on food, for example, you can start asking students about you know, their favorite foods, what they like, dislike, what they've eaten, um, what they had for dinner last night, and so on. If they like cooking, for example, just to get the ball rolling and to relax the students and put them into, comfort, into a comfortable space. Then we have some input. So you want to highlight your target language. If you're doing grammar, you want to highlight the rules, vocabulary, definitions, speaking, pronunciation, and if you're doing a writing exercise, some writing tips. So let's continue with the food topic and say I'm doing a lesson on um, a recipe, for example. I'll highlight some vocabulary and also the structure of a recipe. Then I want students to get into the main task, which is perhaps write a recipe, for example. I'll ask them, I'll, I'll explain to them, sorry, why the task is useful. So this will, if, they're, uh, if they love food, they'll be able to write their own recipe, share it with their friends, etc. 
give an instruction on what I would like them to do, very brief and clear, and then demonstrate what students need to do. Perhaps give them an example of a recipe and show them how it works. Um, then students will complete the task. They'll write their own recipe. I'll give them guidance where needed, just monitor them and check up on them as they go along. And then afterwards, I'll do feedback through error correction and reviewing the target uh, language. Um, we will be doing a section on feedback a little bit later too. And then the post task, this is where I follow up on the activity and consolidate the target language. And this can be done through role plays, discussion and questions, maybe even a speaking task. So perhaps I'd ask the student to present their recipe to me and I'll listen to um, them present it. And they'll be revising the structures and the vocabulary that was covered in the pre and main task. Then lastly, debrief and just reinforce what students have learned. So you can use this for all skills. Once you get used to it, it's a nice little, you know, just a basic structure of a lesson. Okay, last slide here on lesson planning. And this is just some tips that I've um, acquired or learned through the years. Keep it simple, rather a lot from a little than a little from a lot. So. I see some. I see a lot of people trying to have a, or have a lot of materials and trying to rush through them in the lesson, which um, is not very useful for the student. You know, for for a, for an English speaker, a, a text might seem relatively easy, but for a second language learner, they can glean a lot of information from this. So rather spend more time on one text than rushing through two or three. Um, lessons should be interactive and engaging, involve students, and center tasks around them. So. You want to make it as student focused as possible. They are the ones who want to learn to speak English. So try not to talk too much, rather elicit responses from them. This depends on the level, of course. Beginner students need more prompting and help, but at higher levels, students can communicate fairly easily. Create your own materials. As I mentioned in the first slide there, too much time can be spent on trying to, to find, sorry, trying to find the perfect text or media. I've seen so many people um, spend two hours trying to find an article that they need and they say it's too difficult or too easy, just adapt it, rewrite it to be either easier or more difficult. Once that's done, you can then expand and create your materials for the lesson. Um, variety. Try to have different types of activities uh, because it can become monotonous if students do one type, like filling in the missing word. If they do 10 of those, it just really becomes monotonous. So try to do matching activities, filling in the missing word, changing the tenses, writing activities, games, you know, make it fun. And extra activities in case things go faster than expected, very important. Sometimes with your timing, it might, you think this is going to take 10 minutes, but it actually takes five minutes. And if you end the lesson before the expected time, you know, you can't just tell the student because they've paid for an hour. <laughs> you can't just say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have anything more. So you need to have something extra just in case. And lastly, notes, once again, very important. Uh, before the lesson for difficult target language, so you can refer to that. And then also afterwards, just to assess how well the lesson went and what could be changed. You know, teaching is a learning experience, in my opinion, and um, things don't always go as planned, so you can improve yourself. All right, so let's take another look at, well, not another look, let's go to the next slide here and just to summarize very quickly. All right, so planning allows the you as the teacher to feel more confident. You develop trust and motivation and involvement in students because they can see that you're taking um, or making an effort to really try and improve their English. And if the students are happy, the teacher will be happy because you'll get um, more bookings and retain students. Okay, um, Alfred, do you have anything to add there from lesson planning? How do you, you know, maybe how you approach lessons? Um, I think um, you have covered it fully. Um, mm -hmm. I think we might take a few questions from the audience before we move on okay. to the next topic. Sure, I'm happy to so, do that. Let's see. How much time should teachers spend preparing for a 60-minute uh, lesson for an intermediate student? What ah, hi, Ness. Good, good, good question. Um, in my experience, you know, when people start start out, it, lesson planning takes much longer. Um, perhaps an hour or two for a sixty-minute lesson. But as you start gaining experience, um, you do do it in a shorter time. But if you follow the advice of not trying to find perfect materials, get to the 
the material preparation stage where you have your worksheets and your target language, your grammar, your vocabulary, that's what you should be aiming for. So once you find a text that's good, then start planning. Don't spend too much time on the text itself. Okay, do we have um, any other questions before we move on? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, Alfred, you're doing the next okay. uh, section here. Yeah, sure. So, let's start. So, now we're going to move on to study planning. But before we start, we're going to be um, highlighting a quote, which is, planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. Yeah. So, next slide. What is a study plan for? A study plan is when you find yourself procrastinating a lot, when you're trying to create something or you are not able to keep up with the numbers of material you have or numbers of students you have, um, and you can keep up with your current uh, teaching schedule. A study plan is always helpful at those times. So having a study plan is one important feature that helps in an excellent organization, as well as creating a sense of accountability in the student learning uh, process. Remember, planning is essential to succeed in all areas of activities. A study plan is not always um, a timetable. A study plan is more comprehensive than a timetable because it defines a methodology to deal with the preparation, planning, and problem faced in each subject by an individual. So, a goal should be set, items should be prioritized, and an effective study plan should be drawn. And this should be based on the following analytical approach. First of all, how many free hours are available? How to prepare and procure the course material? How much time should be dedicated to each and every student um, in view of the individual requirement? Huh? So. Ha first one would be how to create an environment uh, conducive for a fruit for a fruitful teaching um, environment for for you and your student. So, for example, one can switch off the phone um, for a designated period. So, the following points would be an important aspect aspect of a study plan. Uh, first one would be increased productivity. A study plan will help you split. Uh, your, your teaching into bite-sized chunks and outlining what you need to do every day will help you know exactly what you need to do and when. This way you can learn and memorize more, you can learn and help your student, uh, like you can learn more about your student and you can help your student memorize more effectively and avoid stressing yourself. In addition, a study plan with to-dos for each day will help you avoid procrastinating. Also, that 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 help that makes us move on to time management. When it comes to um, to your success as a teacher on Italki, it is important to effectively use uh, your time and sticking to a timetable. Um, so, a study plan gives you time for the unpredicted. Uh, circumstances for instance if, so, if something pops up uh, you will not have to worry about about it since you have already had time to do stuff and you have split your free times when you're going to be teaching and etc also it is you would feel less stressful because a study plan also helps you reduce stress so not to feel guilty that you are not fully prepared and uh, not to feel guilty that you um, having got your uh, student book another lesson with you, it's better to be prepared ahead. So now we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, and we're going to talk more about how do you write a study plan. So there is a few strategies. There is no like right way to make a study plan, but there is a few tips uh, or a few guidelines that it helps you uh, create your study plan because um, it depends on the person creating the study plan, depends on your specific needs and your students' needs as well. So first one would be analyze your current teaching habits and your students' learning styles. 
think about what works and what does not work for you and for your students. Are you able to teach for long blocks of time once or twice a week? Or is it more effective if you teach nightly, for, for example, for 30 minutes? Are you more productive at a certain time of the day? Do you retain material better if you teach a subject Im immediately without preparing, which is not really uh, advised? So it depends on you as a teacher and it depends on uh, your students. Also, you have to evaluate your current schedule and timetable. Uh, you can use a digital um, application or a paper or a paper calendar to block out all of your standing commitments, including included classes, words. This will let you see how much of your time is already spoken for. So, and we're gonna cover m more about how to create a digital or paper calendar um, later on uh, in the next slide. So also you have to plan how much time would you give for each and every uh, student because it depends on each and every student. Every, each, and st each student is a special case. So someone would take uh, more time to prepare for and another one would be like much easier on, on the go and will help you and will like feel at ease with every and each um, material you, you propose for him. Other would be more demanding. So it depends on your student. So um, at the end, you have to assess your weekly calendar. You have to identify your teaching goals for each class. And that will help you determine how much time you need to spend um, preparing for your classes. So lastly would be sticking to your schedule um, a study plan works best when it's followed consistently uh, you should try to develop a study plan that you can follow for the lens uh, that you prefer for example for um, weekly schedules maybe monthly schedules it depends on you so now we're going to move on to how um, to write uh, or examples to 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 uh, for uh, study plans. So study plan uh, a study plan depends on your style. There is uh, a digital one and there is the old school one. The digital one would be the same as uh, the one which you can find on Italki, the one that helps you uh, sync your classes with the Google Calendar. And this is my favorite way because um, like your phone can give you um, notifications before classes and um, it's, it's much better overall as an experience. And there is the old school uh, way, which is uh, you can go, you can Google Pinterest and you can uh, print uh, ready-made study plans and ready-made schedules. So it depends uh, on your preferences. You can choose either of them. So what do you think, Greg? Um, um, yeah, some good points there. Um, I was would just add that, in my experience, different students have different um, goals and perhaps time frames in which mm -hmm. to achieve these goals. So your study plan will differ from student to student. For example, I have some students who contact me and they need to um, write an IELTS exam, for example, and they have a specific date. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to cover everything they need to know within that specified time. Other people are more relaxed and they just want to improve general English. So you have a much mm -hmm. longer period with them. So it's important to keep things in perspective, um, depending on the type of student you, you get. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now let's move on to the conclusion. So as I said, while I'm talking, no study plan can be winning if it's not followed and executed sincerely. So do you guys have any questions before we move on to the next topic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you plan for students to just say they want to talk? Mm. Um, <laughs> should I, that, should I um, take this one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So um, if students just want speaking activities, then I think the best way to start is to find out their level, 
by having an introductory mm, lesson yeah, with them and hearing mm. hearing what they say and what their problem areas are, especially in terms of pronunciation and grammar. Um, I know some students say they're not interested in grammar, they just want to speak. However, the two are very <clears throat> closely linked. If you want to talk, you're going to need some grammar. But the trick is perhaps to um, just but quickly teach a rule and then have a set of questions that follow this rule. So, for example, the past tense, what did you do yesterday? When do you do, etc. So then they can practice the tense um, and the structure, but still just be speaking. That's uh, one way I approach it. Or just have a nice topic with a list of questions and then correct their pronunciation as you go along. Um, there are quite a few websites that you have. If you Google something like um, ESL or EFL conversation questions, you have websites that bring up a whole list of um, conversation topics that you can copy and paste into your worksheets. And you can just go through the, the questions in that way. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Alfred. Yeah, I think um, if you ask your student what is his or her favorite uh, topics or like maybe mm -hmm. talk about hobbies, maybe talk about um, his or her um, culture, like culturally wise, like where is he from or where is she from, that would be good. Like that would help you create um, a conversation between you guys and will help your student talk more, would give him yeah. more chance to talk in the class. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, personalization, always make the questions. So if, if, for example, if you enjoy a certain topic and you like talking about it, it doesn't mean that the student might enjoy it. So find out, um, you know, how, uh, what the students. Yeah, your interested. students' interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we have one more question. Um, okay, from Alejandro. Since the lesson should be student focused, how do you handle when the student wants to keep speaking and you aren't able to follow <laughs> the plan? Okay, I think it's great to let them speak. What do you stop them? Okay, you can start, Craig. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, some, some classroom management needs to happen. If you have a certain aim in mind in your lesson and you have an hour to reach that aim, yes, the student is enthusiastic and they're, you know, speaking a lot and it might seem wrong of you to stop them, but just uh, say, tell them um, if you have an aim to me to say, okay, thank you so much for your, your contribution. It's, it's amazing. But um, I just want to finish this important part. Explain to them why you're stopping them. Don't just make it seem like you're just shutting them off. Say, we mm -hmm. only have 30 minutes left. Nicely. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the lesson, um, I would like you to have acquired this specific skill or be able to do this. And uh, I just don't want you to lose on that, the bigger goal. You know, so uh, speaking and fluency mm -hmm. is fine, but it's a sub aim. You've got your main aim to focus on. So if you let the student mm -hmm. know, that that's your intention and why you're doing it should be fine. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So we can move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll be covering giving feedback here. And um, of course, during your lesson, you'll be having certain moments when you are uh, when you give students some worksheets and they have to practice, do some writing, filling in missing words. And at the end of these activities, you need to give them some feedback to see how they're doing. Okay, so this is another quote here. There is no failure, only feedback. So I think this is very important. During feedback, you don't want to make students feel like you're focusing on what is wrong. You want to just explain what they did correctly and how they could improve. So try not to focus on just what is incorrect. And we'll look at some tips here on the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so what, let's cover what feedback is. So it's basically teachers providing students with assistance during or after activities. So if a student is busy um, writing something, for example, um, you can monitor them or watch them if it's um, on, online and assist them as they're going along. If you notice a spelling mistake or a grammatical error, you can just bring their attention to it. Um, or you can let them be and have them complete the activity, which is fine, <clears throat> but then do do feedback afterwards just to check their work and then correct them as you go along. Um, teachers providing support to improve the target language plan for the lesson through correction. So if you're doing a grammar focused lesson, you have a specific tense in mind and a student makes a mistake or an error, 
in that uh, without using that specific target language, it's important that you support and improve that um, because that is your main aim. Remember, you, we spoke about planning and your main aim. So if you want students to correctly use a tense by the end of the lesson and you don't correct them throughout the lesson, do you think they'll be able to use the tense correctly? Probably not. So it's important that you give constant feedback during the lesson on this specific aim. Um, of course, students will make errors um, on various tenses during a grammar lesson. Um, there is some debate about whether letting those slide or not. Um, in my opinion, I would let them slide and just focus on the target language. We can always sort out the errors of different uh, grammar in a different lesson. Um, feedback should be a two-way street. Um, this means involve students and elicit responses from them so they may help themselves improve. Um, when I was at school, you know, teachers would just say, no, wrong. <laughs> and it's, it's quite harsh. <laughs> it's quite harsh uh, because you feel... Yeah, you I feel can remember those on. days. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's watching you. And, but if, if they said something like, um, you know, that, that was good, a good attempt, but can you try to say that differently, perhaps? You know, that involves more of a two-way interaction. So it's not just the teacher being the authority and telling students what's right, I'm in control of everything, but involving students. Uh, because uh, very often students don't make errors, but rather mistakes. And so they may possess the ability to correct themselves. And you can encourage, encourage self-correction here. So, for example, if a student says something like, um, teacher, I go to the cinema last night. You could just say, no, that's wrong. It's I went to the cinema, which would be correct, of course. However, the student didn't learn much from this interaction besides that they were wrong. So you can break it down, for example, and elicit self-correction through asking the students questions like, so when did you go to the cinema? The student will say, last night. Okay, so when is last night? That is the past. All right, and what verb did you use? Student will say, go. Okay, so is go past? or present verb. And then hopefully, if the student just made a mistake, they would say, oh, of course, teacher, not go, but um, went. Um, and then they correct themselves. What this does is give the students a bit more confidence because they feel that they have corrected themselves and you, know, you haven't shoved the answer down their throat. If a student really doesn't know and it's an error, then you will have to you know, explain to the student what is wrong and why. But do give the student a chance to correct themselves, at least. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. This is about um, when and how to correct students. And I'll spend some time on here because this is quite important. So depending on your lesson um, aim, if you're doing a grammar lesson or pronunciation lesson, speaking lesson, writing, reading, or listening, the way in which you correct can change um, dependent on the skill. If you're focusing on a grammar um, lesson or pronunciation lesson, we do something that's called hot correction, which means uh, correction on the spot. Because the main aim of your lesson is to improve a grammar point and or a pronunciation area, you don't want to let these slide. So when you hear them, correct the students and as I mentioned earlier try to allow for some self-correction let's just say something like well that word that you said wasn't quite correctly pronounced let's take a look at it you can write it on the board uh, or um, in your google documents for example and then just go over the phonetics of the, the the word and allow students to you know repeat it um, if it's grammar for example you would have covered the rules um, in your, your pre-task, as we went over earlier, and then just refer them back to the rules and tell them, well, we've covered the rules. Can you just look at your structure? It might not be correct. The tense is not correct, etc. So during and after controlled practice. Um, controlled pack practice is basically what's, what we would call worksheets. And the reason they're called controlled practice is because the teacher is controlling what the students um, are doing. You know, if you have a worksheet and there's a word missing and students can only use a specific word for that sentence, you're controlling the activity. They cannot write their own word in there. So as students are completing this uh, worksheet, you can take a look at what they're doing and 
um, give your advice during this, or you can leave them be, let them finish the entire worksheet. Perhaps if you've given it for homework, um, these are those types of activities are great for homework. And then your next lesson, you can then speak to the student, go by sentence by sentence, and then tell them that sentence is good, or this one is not quite correct. Let's refer back to the rule and allow for feedback to be this back and forth experience. Okay, speaking and fluency. So this would be tasks uh, such as debates pr or presentations, you know, where the student is given some time to speak freely. Now here, it wouldn't be very pragmatic to interrupt the student. If you're having a debate um, with a student or in a group, doesn't matter what the, the situation is, or presenting something, which is usually a, um, an individual task, it would be horrible for the student if the teacher would pause every time they hear an, an error and say, sorry, mm, wrong, <laughs> can we please correct that? Even if you do it nicely and say, oh, that's not quite correct, could you please um, rephrase that? It interrupts the flow of the activity. And the main aim here would be to get students to speak freely, uh, not specific things like grammar and pronunciation. So the best method here would be to use cold correction. And hot correction is when you correct on the spot as you hear errors. But with cold correction, it's best to take some notes. What I usually do is have a notebook with me and I write furiously as students are speaking, or I would uh, type some notes on my Google document, Google shared document. Um, and then remember also to add good sentences, very important. Don't just write all the mistakes down. Uh, add some good sentences. And at the end of the speaking time, we can say you can give the students some good encouragement and say, oh, that was amazing. That was good. Well done. Here are some sentences that I heard you say that were great. I see you've um, improved on your grammar and your pronunciation. Um, however, here's a couple of sentences that I feel we could improve on. And then show the students these sentences. And they can then, you go through the feedback process where they can correct themselves. And of course, the ones where they cannot correct themselves, you can have some input. But what commonly happens is the students know the rules and they can easily perhaps do them on a worksheet because they're thinking about it. They're, they're sitting still, they've got the rules next to them. But when it comes to speaking, the rules tend to go out the window sometimes. So with cold correction, you, you are just reinforcing this accuracy. Okay, then with writing. Um, so with Writing can be tricky because students are busy. It's quite an intense activity. Um, if you're teaching online, I would most probably do writing for homework because it wastes a lot of class time. Um, in terms of the student is paying for a lesson, then they spend 30 minutes writing. You're not doing anything. So they might not feel they're getting their money's worth. So perhaps with homework tasks, it's much better. And um, Alfred will be covering homework in a second. So once they've completed this writing, you get it back. You will have to do some feedback on this as well. Um, when I was at school, I remember this is another school story when the teacher would just, you know, murder my page in red ink. It looked like uh, some horrible battle taken place. Uh, <laughs> with uh, ESL teaching, we tend to be a little bit softer, maybe use a different color than red if you're marking on paper. But Seeing that it's digital, you can have a, choose whatever colors you want on, on your documents and highlight words. Maybe give students tips instead of just explicitly correcting them. Say things like, uh, check the grammar here, spelling here, so that they can once again try and self-correct. Students remember things much better if they self-correct and build confidence if they are given the chance to self-correct. And then lastly, with reading and listening activities. Um, with reading and listening activities, there's usually some vocabulary section where students learn new vocabulary. And then afterwards, they have to read a text, listen to a text, and there will be some comprehension questions just to show some understanding of the text. That is the traditional approach. Of course, not, not every reading and listening lesson uh, follows that approach. But if you do follow that approach, students will have some written answers and you need to check these answers. So um, have your notes ready on the correct answers so that make sure that you've listened and read the texts before this uh, lesson takes place and you have your, your memorandum. <laughs> and then during the feedback, um, if they've 
made some mistakes. Don't again, don't tell them simply, no, that's the incorrect answer. Ask them, are you sure about that? Let's look at paragraph five. Maybe that's where the answer is. And then students can refer to that paragraph and hopefully they can again find the correct answer. So you'll notice the theme here. I'm saying allow the student to correct themselves a lot. This does vary from level to level. Beginner students will have more difficulty doing this than your intermediate and up students. Um, but do try. And if they cannot help themselves, then you step in as the teacher. But it has to be a, um, uh, you know, a back and forth. Because what's happening during this back and forth is not just the fact that they are trying to correct themselves. They're also learning communication skills. You're asking them a question. So these are things that are not planned for in the lesson. They're incidental um, in the lesson, but it's still focusing on or, or improving communication. All right, let's take a look at the last slide here. So to summarize here, feedback allows students to learn from mistakes and errors if you allow them to self-correct. Um, if it's done correctly, it allows students to become um, autonomous language learners. So <clears throat> if you constantly question them and say, all right, that was good, but can you think about what you've said? Um, it'll lead to a habit. When they leave the classroom, they will think about things before they say them, hopefully, and um, in that way be constantly able to self-correct. And lastly, good communication between teacher and student, of course, and confidence, because you're not just telling the student, no, you're wrong, and correcting them. You're allowing them to interact and improve themselves. Okay. Uh, so let's see if there's any questions on feedback and mm. error correction. I think we might have a lot in this section specifically. Mm -hmm. Do so you advise? Let's... Okay. Uh, do you advise to give uh, feedback to students to, at every lesson? Yes, I do. I would give students feedback with every task. It's very, very important. Um, if they're doing yeah, something, totally in, agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if they're doing something in a lesson and you haven't told them how they've done or what they've done incorrectly, what they should improve on. Um, you've missed an aim then, you know, they haven't really, they wouldn't, how would they know that they've improved on a certain area? So yes, feedback all the time. Yeah, feedback is really vital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to keep your student on track as well. So Nargis Kamrani, she has a question. In that case, should we teach the grammar that session or leave it for the next session, uh, for the next class mm -hmm. or lesson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, in, in in what case? I think there's something uh, missing. I, I think she refers to grammar sessions or grammar mm -hmm. mistakes. Yeah, grammar oh, mistakes. Oh, yes, oh yeah. I see. So if a student makes a grammar uh, mistake in that lesson. Oh, I see. Um, depending on how much time you have in the lesson and if it's going to move away from you meeting your main aim of the lesson, uh, you can do a quick correction. And maybe make a note of it and say, this could be for another lesson. Um, but you don't want to get sidetracked too much to the point where you miss your main aim of your current lesson and start explaining something entirely different. Yeah. So correct and move on and uh, perhaps mm. leave it for another lesson. Yeah, always, always meet your main aims for your current lesson. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Regarding the previous class, um... One good thing would be not like some sometimes I don't have much time during class to offer my feedback on real time. One good thing would be offering it through a follow up email, maybe when yes. when you're sending your homework. That would be a good idea as well. Mm, that's a good point. I also do that with the Google Share documents because it's on the cloud and my students have the mm -hmm, link. Exactly. I'll just make a summary of the lesson if I didn't have time from my notes and they can just take a mm -hmm. look at it later on. So that's one of the another advantage of, you know, being online. You can send students feedback all the time. Yeah. Okay. So David, um, yeah. should we you correct writing in front of them or correct before? class then explaining during the class uh -huh. so with it depends on the type of student um, usually because it's online um, writing does take a long time so i would have my students complete the writing um, before class and then i'll take a read through it and i'll correct it um, during the class 
um, with most students, that's okay. Because then I can do, you know, um, this back and forth with each line of the, the writing um, piece. I, I did have one student that preferred me to correct everything before and leave notes for her. And then she would then try and correct everything herself. And then in class, we'd look at the double correction, so to speak. Uh, so that was interesting. But generally, I would um, ex correct it um, in class, mostly, yes. During during the class, go through it line by line. Yeah, I mean, one good thing you mentioned is giving the writing tasks as homework. This is a yeah. good thing not to waste a lot of time during the class. Yeah. You know. Definitely, I do that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do we have? Uh, yeah, I think we have. So, okay, Jesse, mm -hmm. you can go ahead, Craig. Okay, so if a student keeps making mistakes about this, I think grammar explains the grammar and practice that he or she is good, but when he or she writes, he, he gets it wrong again. Yes, so there's something called um, embedded or fossilized errors. And what happens in this case is that a student um, has continuously made the same mistake and perhaps they've gone uncorrected um, in, because they haven't uh, hadn't taken lessons or um, someone didn't correct them in class. So it's very difficult to unlearn these uh, mistakes. But as a teacher, don't feel bad if a student, you know, makes the same mistake after you corrected mm -hmm. them just one minute ago. It's it's a fairly common thing. Um, what you just need to do is be consistent with your error correction. Keep doing it and noticing when the student does it and they will improve. Um, I had a student that keeps making the same mistake in pronunciation. And with three lessons in, and slowly now they're becoming aware that when they see the sound, the spelling, they stop and, oh, okay, I wanted to say it this way because that's what I'm used to, but I'm going to correct myself. So because I've been, you know, highlighting that. So just keep going with the correction and don't feel bad if the student keeps making the same mistake. Yeah, don't get bored. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a subconscious thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Now, I think we are done with the questions for now. Uh, we can yes. move on to our next yeah, our next topic. So our next topic is basically giving and checking homework. So uh, most of the students feel like um, when they have a homework, it's boring. It's, it's going to waste time. We're not going to have any good out of it. But no, since we are digital, it's totally different. So let's start with a small quote and then we gonna move on to break down some stuff. So nothing is more powerful for your future than being a gatherer of good ideas and, and information. That's called you're doing your homework. So we're gonna be covering um, why do we need to give homework? So the role of homework um, have been hardly mentioned in the majority of courses suggesting that there is a little question as to its value even if the resulting workload is time consuming however there is clearly room for discussion of homework uh, like practices and policies and practically now that technology has made so many more resources available to learners outside the classroom so um, homework is usually expected um, out of teachers because this is how we have been um, learned like when we were in school we usually had homeworks and stuff so it's an expected task out of you in your class so you can make your home you can make homework um, reinforce and helps learner to retain an information taught in the classroom and we're going to be covering how to do that in the next slide but for now um, we're going to be discussing why do we need to give homework. So, as we said, it reinforces um, the, and helps learner retain information. Also, it develops study habits and independent learning because it encourages uh, your student to acquire resources such as dictionaries, grammar, reference books. Um, also, if they do, if you give them a task, um, like to do a research, for example, um that homework also shows the factual knowledge of your uh, student and helps you identify their repeated mistakes so it helps you help your student get over their, their repeated mistakes and it helps um, it helps retain some sort of uh, self-discipline between 
your student um, doing his homework and you being able to conduct a class uh, while knowing that your student have uh, benefited um, from all from all aspects in your classroom. Also, homework offers opportunities for extensive activities and the receptive skill, which there may be not a lot of time uh, for them in classroom, especially we are um, in, a in a digital environment. So it may be also integral part of an ongoing learning, such as maybe project work, and uh, maybe is the use of a graded reader. Um, adding that homework provides continuity between lessons. So you don't wanna, you don't want your student not to be ready for his or her upcoming class. So a homework can help uh, sort this problem. Like it may be used to consolidate classwork. And also it may be used for preparation for the next lesson. Like you can give them a uh, small research to do about the upcoming, uh, for example, vocabulary, for, for example, maybe a certain topic that you want them to make a research on. Um, homework also may be used to shift um, repetitive and mechanical time-consuming tasks out of the classroom. As we said, most of the receptive skill would like uh, make us waste a lot of time during class. So homework bridges the gap between um, you and your student because student teachers um, can monitor the progress in between classes, but for the long run, uh, giving tasks and following up with your student would help your student um, benefit from that and help them like uh, attain their goal in a shorter time. So um, I know that teachers tend to have mixed feelings about homework uh, while recognizing the advantages. Uh, they observe negative attitudes and poor performance from uh, your students. Uh, but making and giving useful feedback, as we, as Craig have said and mentioned in the previous topic on homework, can take up a large portion of a teacher's time. So it's preferred to um, have some sort of communication throughout maybe a Google document, maybe a follow-up email. So, yeah. And sometimes students themselves complain that homework they are given is boring or pointless. And we're going to talk more about how to, in, to how to overcome that. So referring to homework tasks that consist of studying for tests, no, we are not doing that. We are, we are conducting class, like an environment so that we can feel at ease while uh, learning uh, the needed languages or like the needed language, my bad. So doing workbook exercising or finishing in incomplete classwork, memorizing lists of vocabulary, or maybe writing compositions, all of that may be a little bit boring, but we can adjust it a little bit so that the student can feel at ease while doing this. So we don't want to make our students feel that they are punished or that they are um, having to do anything with like related to school. You know, back in the days, we we uh, we have been facing like a lot of punishments um, if we didn't do our homework. No, we are not do trying to do that. We are trying to make it more effective. So there is certain principles uh, uh, to make our homework effective so this principle should be observed so student the students should see the usefulness of homework like teachers should explain the purpose both of homework in general and individual tasks so tasks should be relevant to your class and you to your uh, uh, to to the interests of your student so, and it should be varied as well so a good classroom practice also applies to homework tasks should be manageable but achievable like try to make it a little bit challengeable but keep in mind and bear in mind your students level um, also different tasks may be assigned to different uh, to different ability uh, depending on your students like every individual have a learning style that should be taken into account so it depends on your student um, also, it should be manageable in terms of time. Like you should discuss time uh, with your student. You should know where is he free, where is 
well, uh, when is he free and um, when is he able to do homework when when is he able to take a bigger task than the use than the one he used to have so teachers should uh, remember that students are often um, like having other duties to do in their life so this this is a really vital important uh, point to keep in mind so um, homework is really coordinated with a curriculum and as a whole it depends or maybe a material that you teach from but should be at least um, incorporated into an overall scheme of work like you should be planning ahead what are you gonna give as a homework what are you gonna be teaching as a material in your class and that should be considered in your lesson planning so <clears throat> so we're gonna now move to the next slide to discuss some um, examples of homeworks so we have there are a number of categories um, of useful and practical homeworks that you can offer your students, one of which is work-based tasks. So what is work-based tasks? So this is basically, you know, most published uh, course materials it can include a workbook or a practice book, mainly including consolidation exercises, uh, short reading texts, and an answer key um, with them. So most work book, uh, most workbooks claim to be suitable for both class and self study use, but it's better it, it's they are better used at home in order like they are better used when when you give them the task to do like by by themselves in order to achieve the separation of what is done in class and at home. So mechanical practice is shifted out of a class out of <clears throat> class hours, while this kind of exercise is particularly suited to peer or self-checking and correction like when when you want your student to go through the mistakes that he have committed uh, during class um, you can give him a task that consists of um, his mistakes like for example a multiple choice type of task or depending on what you want to do that will be um, under the title of workbook based tasks and it's given to self-check and correct um, and self-correct. So also we have uh, preparation tasks. So preparation tasks, um, rarely do teachers ask learners to read through the next unit of a course book, though there are um, a little bit of uh, bright side in that because you are involving your student in the lesson plan and you having them know what is coming um it's a bit more motivating however asking students to find and bring materials such as maybe photographs pictures magazine articles which are relevant to the next topic uh, particular particularly where personalization or relevance to the local context require adaptation to what you're giving them in your course or what are you trying to teach them so um, also, we have extensive tasks, uh, which which um, which are much much can be gained from the use of graded readers, which now often have accompanying audio materials, uh, radio, podcasts, uh, songs. Sometimes tasks need to be set as guidance, but learners also need to be encouraged to read, or listen, or watch this th we, we are trying to please them we are trying to make them uh feel fun during their journey acquiring a language so what is important is that as a learner shared their experience in class so extensive reading and listening may be accompanied by dictionary work um, or personalized vocabulary notebook like you can give you can do a, a worksheet or a document Word document um, that contains some sort of uh, vocabulary chunks that relates to your student. And um, we move on to the last one, where is, which is real world uh, tasks, which is my favorite actually. So this involves seeing, hearing, and putting languages to use in realistic contexts. So it's some sort of reading magazines, watching TV, going to the cinema, maybe uh, listening to songs those are obvious examples so you are offering the option of like 
you can offer them the option of writing summaries of what they uh, watch or what they listen to. And uh, you can review it, review it with them as a follow-up activity. So nowadays technology has facilitated um, chat and uh, um, friendship networks. Everything is kind of easy nowadays. So you can give them your email, maybe you can share with them. Like you can tell them that they are, they can reach you out through um, messages uh, on your italki. They, you can give them a task like watch a certain uh, part of a specific film or maybe listen to a specific podcast. And you can ask them to write a summary about what they understood. And mm -hmm. um, you can review it with them on the upcoming class. This is mm -hmm. a good way to include the student into the class and, and like to have a fun environment together. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, um, sorry, sorry, Alfred, I just want to uh -huh. add to the, to the homework, um, types of yeah, homework, sure, if, definitely. If, if, you, if you don't mind, um, just yeah, in my sure. experience, it depends on, um, of which type of student you have. Students have different learning styles and multiple intelligences and so on. So some students prefer, you know, workbook based activities where it's just grammar rules, filling in worksheets. And, and I've noticed that with some students, this doesn't work at all. So perhaps a real world um, task can um, help here with them. Some students who are more visual in their approach. Mm -hmm, and exactly. you might have students who are more kind of aesthetic, who prefer moving around. And um, I think we spoke about, uh, you know, having students go to an actual restaurant, walking around the streets, <clears throat> asking for directions if they're in an English speaking country. Uh, so that really makes it more authentic than just looking at a page. But different things work for different people. And you need to find out what type of student you have mm -hmm. and what works best for them. Um, so when giving homework, don't just simply say, hey, here's some homework. <clears throat> Try and find out what homework works for the student. Like, do you prefer doing mm -hmm. this? Because I know, like you said, some people think that homework is boring. Maybe it's boring because of the type of homework. So I'm happy you explained all of these types here. Just find out which type your student prefers. I think it's a good point as well. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Craig. You summarized you summarized it all. Uh, I think now we can move on to have a few questions from our audience, mm -hmm. and um, and then we're gonna conclude everything up. Okay. So most of our students are working or are studying. We don't have, want to overburden them with a lot of homework. How do we give homework in a way? That doesn't place a heavy burden on the students. A very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <clears throat> I can. Do you have any, do you have any can, tips here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can say, as I said while presenting my uh, topic, you can basically talk with them about like their time. Like you can ask them um, whether they got free time, whether um, they can do um, long or short tasks. Like you can talk with them, you can share everything with them, you can include them in your um, planning, in your class planning. So, um, if a student said that he's busy, you can um, ask him, uh, "What if I gave you a short task to do? Would that be a problem?" Um, I don't think the student would mind that, but he would be actually like he would agree to that, and he would really who would be keen to do that so yeah try to include your student ask him or ask her and um, this is a better way of communication between mm -hmm. you and your students yeah also perhaps that the time limit on the homework if you have another lesson coming up in a couple of days then say okay you don't have to do the homework for that lesson let's do it for mm -hmm. the lesson thereafter mm -hmm. so give them give them a specific time one week for homework so they don't feel rushed uh, if they have another lesson booked with you um you know and as we said um as we said <laughs> as we said you know, you're teaching adults, so you can't force people to do homework. For the most part, we're teaching adults. I know some are not. Um, and yeah, you can't be angry with people if they say they're busy or they don't want to do homework. It's it's more as an, uh, an add-on to the lesson, but it's not, you know, not going to be accepted by everybody or not um, helpful in all cases. Yeah, I just noticed the question is over my face. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I hope I answered you while not expressing my facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, we can have another question from Blake Taylor. Um, what if the students never do the homework, barely study by themselves at home and totally blank in class, like totally relying on the teacher in the class? <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, I can share you a personal experience on that. I had a students like this. Um, simply, you can talk with them. Like you can simply tell them that, uh, you know, we are not going to... Um, we are not going to get any further if you don't put um, any works up front. Like you have to put a little bit of work so that you can attain your goal. So like, yeah, try to make your relationship with your students as open as possible. Uh, like try not to act as a teacher, try more to act as a friend, I would say, because this would make the environment more lovely and it will be more fun for your student to learn and um, acquires uh, the language needed. So, yeah. Hmm. Would you love yeah. to add anything, Craig? No, I agree. I mean, you know, sometimes teachers think that if the student is not um, motivated, it's their fault. Well, sometimes it is. You know, if you, if you, it's about the effort that you put in. The more energetic and perhaps friendly, like you said, you are, the more motivated the student will be. But you can't please everybody. <clears throat> And mm, if the student definitely. doesn't reciprocate the effort you're putting in, then it's not your fault. But explain to them, as um, as Alfred said, why this is useful. Um, what I do think is it depends on the type of student you have. If you have an adult student who is out of their own volition signing up for lessons, they're far more likely to do that with you, as opposed to, and I don't want to say <laughs> anything negative about younger learners, but a lot of time they don't perhaps maybe want to be in the class and you might have struggle, uh, might struggle with getting homework out of them and so on. It just depends on the student's motivation. So don't feel too bad as long as you try and uh, tell them, as Alfred said. Mm -hmm. Okay, David, um, the second question. What kind of homework do you find to be most effective? Videos, grammar, exercises? Okay. Um, Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I think the best uh, effective um, and interactive kind of homework that works for me really good would be the vocabulary type of um, uh, task. And I would use real world um, I, uh, as an example. Like I would give my student some sort of a video maybe or a podcast or um, a part of a news and that would uh, it would be covering the vocabulary that we have learned during our class, and I would ask him to uh, try to uh, summarize it or pick up the word the words that we have learned, or maybe if, if there is any new words that he have any questions about, uh, he can include it as well in the Google document shared between me and, and him. And there is this is uh, more effective to help him. Uh, go through the vocabulary that he or she have learned during our class. And also, um, um, it, as I said, it helps in it, like your the receptive skills is working. Like he's listening to the stuff that he learned during our class. So this helps him memorize and uh, acquire the language much faster. So, yeah, this is for me. What about you, Craig? Um, it really depends on the type of student, and um, you know, like as I said earlier, some students have mm -hmm. a specific focus; they want to improve their grammar. So then I would go more workbook-based type activities, worksheets, you know, and, and just mm -hmm. to drill the yeah. grammar point point home. Um, others want to. Um, speak more so preparation tasks might be good i'll say okay by the next lesson i'd like you to uh, prepare a speech for me or you know something like that and then present it to me um, mm -hmm. as you said real work tasks uh, so it really depends on my student um, it's not whether homework is most effective or least effective it's how effective is it yeah, for yeah. that student mm -hmm. exactly yeah mm -hmm. okay so with Charlotte, uh, we have, what should we do when a student states explicitly <laughs> that they don't want to do any homework? Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, it's their um, preference. If they don't want to have any homework, it's fine. It's not an obligation to have in, in your study, like in your teaching plan. You can simply, yeah, you can simply adjust um, on your student uh, on your student preference. Yeah. So it depends. 
I had a student that didn't do any of the homework I gave them. <laughs> Literally, I gave them homework to improve the areas that they were on, and they just did not do the homework. And um, they were paying for the lessons. And I said, if you want your money's worth, this is going to help you. But they were more focused on just speaking. Um, and it's their choice. As, you know, you can't force people. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've, we've, we've already done this question. Yeah, we have already done this question. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm. All right, Let's shall see. we just summarize and then take um, random questions yeah. at the end? Yeah, just to sure. wrap up. Okay. So, yeah, um, planning feed as we've gone through, planning and giving feedback and giving homework will ensure that you provide quality lessons to students and uh, get you know, satisfied students in the end. And that's the aim here on italki, is to make sure that students are satisfied, they're improving their um, language skills, and you hopefully get, um, you know, repeat bookings and retain students. So I hope these tips have helped you. And uh, yeah, all the best in, in, in implementing them. As you said, mm -hmm. as you said have... if the student's happy, that you're happy, so yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Are there any? We're just about done, but we can take a few um, questions just yeah, about the entire time. entire um, um, presentation. If you guys would like to ask any any additional ones, or if we have any questions in the chat that we can still um, um, take from. All right, Alfred. Do you have anything to add towards the end here? Uh, I think we have um, covered everything today for um, planning and uh, how to give feedback and also how to give effective homework. And mm -hmm. homework doesn't have to be... Um, sorry, Alpha, we've got a obligated. question. Mm, we've got a question uh -huh. coming through. Sorry to, to, sorry to yeah, interrupt sure. you. Yeah, uh -huh. um, sure. Do you use, do you use a, a real mm -hmm, board? Do you use a real board, a uh, whiteboard in online teaching? For me, it isn't very effective. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it depends. Like uh, sometimes it depends on, like it depends on the case. If you're trying to explain something that requires a whiteboard, uh, you can use digital whiteboards. Um, there is one included in the italki classroom and there's also one included in Zoom. So you can use a digital one. You don't have to get uh, one physically. Uh, but in most cases, I don't really use it or I don't really need it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it, <clears throat> it depends on, for me, again, the level of the student. Um, I usually use a whiteboard or digital whiteboard, actually, not, a, not an actual yeah. whiteboard for drawing very simplistic um, images for lower level students to describe the vocabulary that I'm teaching. But for the level of students that I normally teach, um, it's not really an, an aid that I need to use because with online teaching, you've got other aids like uh, screen share and Google shared documents, which make things a lot better. Mm -hmm. in, in an actual classroom, a board is really important, but not on, online, in my opinion. Okay. Do you give uh, feedback to every lesson on the student profile? Um, hmm. What do you do, Craig? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Um, yeah, I, I mean, have, me too. I sometimes, mm -hmm. I sometimes have a lot of lessons in a day and back to back, and it will take a lot of time for me to write. Um, I would do at least one per student, though. Um, after a yeah, couple of lessons, if too. I see may maybe the initial lesson to say. Thank you for the booking. It was nice meeting you, and I'm happy that we can work together and looking forward to the future lessons. And then after maybe 10, 20, 15 lessons, however many they take, then just an update on their improvement. Yeah, but it's not necessary to mm -hmm. write for it. I mean, I doubt everyone reads every single thing written on their profile. Yeah, me too. I totally agree with you. It was the mm -hmm. same thing exactly. Okay. Um, would it be effective to use the same lesson plan for different students or should we plan for every lesson separately? Um, I think as like for the first class uh, between you and any students, you might uh, have the same kind of uh, structure for the class, but moving on, you would get to know 
your student and if your student is a bit different than the others so here here here's the situation where you have to start planning specifically for that student mm -hmm. so it depends on your student yeah um if, if the students have similar aims and what they would like to achieve then yes use the same lesson plan because the students are not going to know that you've taught this before uh, with another student mm -hmm. yeah exactly um, so you, you can recycle but obviously if it's not per the student's requirements then don't use it mm -hmm. Okay, any tips on what do want what to do uh, when the students English is not good enough to teach them uh, like they want to learn Spanish and we are having trouble with the English level. Um, what do you think, Quark? Um This is a tough one. You know, I don't usually teach uh, beginners. I do have experience with beginners, but in my experience on italki, a lot of the students do have a little bit of English already, but if they don't have any English, um, Okay, let me just check the question. So they want to, the students' English is not good enough to teach. They want to learn Spanish and we're having trouble. So you, you're teaching them Spanish, but explaining things in English? Is that what you're English, saying? English, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think this is what he means, yeah. Okay. I was thinking about mm -hmm. if the students' English is not good and that's the language that you're communicating in. Hmm. Um, Alfred, you're, 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 uh, you're a yeah, second language. Yeah, so, so in yeah, your I ex teach, personal I, experience, I, how did my you... Experience, um, okay, in my experience, I tend to make it clear to everybody that I teach using specific languages so that I, when I am booked, um, I get booked by wow. students who speak the languages that I speak, not to face this problem. So it's better to be clear on your profile that you you teach oh. in a specific like in specific languages like for me i teach egyptian arabic and i teach it using french and and and, and english and um and yeah that's it and it's clear on my profile that i only use those two languages teaching the egyptian arabic so oh. one good thing is to be clear on your profile uh so that you don't get booked by students who are like not speaking the languages that you speak oh. Yeah, that's that's good because I, I teach I teach English only and I you know speaking I don't teach in different languages like you do so uh -huh. that's a good that's good advice yeah I, I wouldn't have known that <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I think um, that was it for today I hope everybody enjoyed it uh, we covered mm -hmm. uh, how to simply how to simply develop as a teacher using tools, media notes, and homework in the classroom. It was oh, presented so by, yeah, it was presented by me, Alfred, and um, Craig here. So, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good Thank day. Thank you for being Bye. here. Have a good one. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.